welcome to the download where we bring you discussion and analysis from a Catholic perspective. Today's Thursday, October 5th, 2023. I'm Brad Eli here with my two co-hosts, Christine Niles and Trey Brock. In two recent posts on his blog, college professor Ryan Burge, also a Baptist <coughs> pastor, took a look at recent data from about a college students regarding their religious identity, political affiliation, and sexual orientation. Parts of this data are particularly interesting for Catholics. If we look at this chart Burge made on political affiliation broken down by religion, it divides the students into strong Democrats, weak Democrats, Democrat-leaning, and independent, as well as Republican-leaning, weak Republicans, strong Republicans. In the third row, we see Mormons, abbreviated LDS for Latter-day Saints, and they're the most likely to back the GOP. Catholics are trailing behind with mere 30%, saying that they least lean Republican, while 54% of self-identified Catholics, over half, favor the Democrats to some degree. Meanwhile, the most fiercely Democratic religious group, get this, are atheists and agnostics. A whopping 81% of atheists and 80% of agnostics at least lean Democrat. Uh, well, that part of it actually makes sense. If you don't have much morals, you know, you're the, the, the pro-death party. I mean, uh, sorry, but if you're in the tank for abortion, anywhere, anytime, on demand, all the way up to partial birth, and in the tank for every sexual deviancy and known to man, you, that's probably who you're going to be as agnostic and an atheist. And the Democrats specifically, they made a very big deal about taking God out of their platform. So it makes sense that atheists and agnostics would lean heavily Democrat. Uh, something else very striking as well is the, the makeup of the self-identified LGBTQ population, especially among U.S. adults as well as Gen Z and, and you know, college students. We have some statistics here that are actually quite alarming. If you all recall, maybe just 20 years ago, I'd say only about 2% of the population identified as LGBT. That number has now gone to 7% of U.S. adults identifying as LGBT. Gen Z, of course, that's even higher. That's 20%. One in five of every Gen Zer <laughs> claims to be identified Doesn't as Doesn't bode well for the future of the country. No, and of course, you know, you have to question the numbers as well because we, we know that this LGBT indoctrination is starting very young among the youngest of the children. Preschool, as we know, all these horrible books being, um, you know, proposed and, and teachers and all sorts of things. And so... It's now being treated almost like a fad. You know, it's like it's it's their way of expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. It's their rebellion, and so some of these people actually end up growing out of it. So that's the good news. They end up kind of, it's kind of a phase for them, um, and then they end up growing out of it. So. You know, I don't know how accurate the statistics actually are, but it's interesting looking at the breakdown by religion. The religious group that is most likely to be straight is, no surprise, Muslims. Second most likely is Protestants. The third most straight is Catholics. And then the fourth is just Christian. Uh, but I think you have even more numbers on this. Yeah, the um, uh, Brown University part of that report that we, we're talking about right now, um, uh, Brown University indicated that 38% of their student body identifies as homosexual, bisexual, queer, asexual, pansexual, questioning, or other. And they mentioned how 10 years ago that was at 14%. Um, that is wild. 38% now, um, I guess you can just say, is not straight, identifies as not straight. Wow. Um, I don't know what to say other than don't send your kid to Brown. But um. <laughs> uh, the, These stats were actually gathered by uh, uh, a group, Foundation for Individual <laughs> Rights and Expression. They're an advocacy group uh, which has a mission to defend uh, free speech and, and, and free thought. These are the good guys gathering the statistics. And what they call the, this FIRE data set was included by Ryan Burge in his most recent article, The Culture War is Alive and Well on College Campuses. And Burge, for him, he wanted to talk about this free speech, this, this, this freedom of expression. How free are you to talk about things on, things that really matter, on campus? So that's where he was going with this latest article, and that's why he included that data set in there. And what he found was that conservative students, those who have conservative morals, such as maybe you shouldn't kill babies, um, or maybe you should be straight, they were the least likely to talk out on campuses, is what he found. Now, he said, uh, a, a quote from that article, among the most Republican, that was 6.6% of the full sample, uh, say that they just cannot speak freely 
on you know various moral issues, hot button topics today, you know transgenderism and and, and this type of stuff. Here's a here's a, a quote from there. It's readily apparent that the folks who express the most reluctance to actually speak on controversial issues are those who feel further out of step from their university. I'm not entirely convinced that this problem is more acute on the far right or left. People who feel like their politics don't fit their environment are the most likely to express hesitation. Now, there's a whole truth about that, and yet we have the idea that politics don't necessarily dictate what your morals are gonna be. And, and I would throw to Trey here about this. Um, not taking away from what Burge is saying, he has a point there typically the more Republican you are, the more conservative you're gonna be, the more Democrat you are in, in morality. But remember the, the slogan was make America great, not make America moral again, <laughs> okay? Uh, even though the, the 2016 Dem uh, Republican platform was extremely conservative morally, you got in there and you know all, all sorts of morality. So, Trey, on campus following this, if everybody is on the same playbook politically, and you all feel like you're one regarding that. You went to Hillsdale, everybody's pretty much Republican there, right, mm -hmm. GOP. They're all that way, they're all coming in, they all feel in sync with regard to that. You could talk about anything political and everybody would be chiming about that. But what about when you got into moral topics, even right. though they're all in the same playbook politically? Right, yeah, you see a, a huge um, sort of divide there. They don't uh, go hand in hand. You're, you're free to speak about politics, that's no problem, but when, basic morality comes up uh, you know a lot of a lot of uh, hard right Republicans keep their mouths shut and I think that's reflective of you know most most people who identify with being Republican over their 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 Christian faith or their Catholic faith um, and that's why I think it's especially important for kids in college like especially young men who are involved they're so passionate about politics but they couldn't care less about natural law, divine revelation. That's what they should be passionate about. Um, but they end up, because they're so passionate about politics, they're just following the crowd. That's what everybody does. Um, so they throw their identities um, behind guys like Trump or DeSantis who, uh, to put it nicely, I mean, they're not, they're not champions of, uh, of any sort of uh, uh, Christ, Christian faith. Trump, the other you know, a couple, couple weeks ago, whatever it was, you know, he said that a six-week abortion ban was a, a terrible decision or something. And then, obviously, DeSantis is okay with all the gay stuff. He sends a, a, a baby onesie to Ron DeSantis, and, or not uh, Ron DeSantis, to uh, Dave Rubin and his, uh, and his, and his you know, husband. Um, so they throw their identities in with these guys. But when it comes to basic morality, things like abortion, um, things like, uh, uh, I don't know, masculinity, femininity, there's, they're, they're nowhere to be found because that stuff is not politically correct. And as the Republicans we know, they've watered down their identity so much that the people who are following them, the young men who are following them, they know it's not PC to talk about this stuff. So my experience on campus, Hillsdale's a great place. I love Hillsdale, I owe a lot to them. Um, but it's as you said, to put it uh, simply, politics is fine to talk about, morality, things like abortion, um, that's something that people would kind of, you know, th things would get awkward when you start bringing those things up, but politics is fine. Well, even more so on just the regular liberal college campuses, of course you're gonna get shouted down by the, by the atheists and agnostics, but well, you wouldn't expect that at a place where you know you're on the same playbook mm -hmm. politically. Yeah, yeah. Well, on, on the the atheists and, and agnostics, the the report actually mentions this. It says the groups that are least likely to say that they are straight, um, and talking about college college students, are atheists at 55 percent and agnostics at 53 percent, which is a, a wild statistic. Um, but it sort of I thought it was might be worth mentioning. Um, I, we know that campuses, any regular college campus is going to be, it's not going to lead people towards God. It's not going to lead people towards reality. Even the Catholics, Catholic colleges around um, don't seem to do that. They water down the faith and whatnot. Um, Back in the 60s, there's a um, guy, his name is John Sr., and uh, he started what's called the Integrated Humanities Program. And a lot of that was foundational to schools like Hillsdale that teach the liberal arts, and a lot of their students end up um, sane when they, when they graduate. And um, he saw, John Sr. saw how the culture, how all these students were just swallowed up by materialism, subjectivism, obviously atheism, agnosticism would go hand in hand with that. And they were... Um, Speaking about Aquinas, Augustine, even Aristotle, 
that didn't even register with them. So he will, he didn't water it down, but he opened them up to guys like uh, to things like Shakespeare, uh, um, the Homer's Iliad, stuff like that. And the students, <coughs> the students all ended up becoming. Most of them ended up becoming um, religious. A lot of them became. Many of them became Catholic. And I have a quote from a biography written on John Senior. It says, "Not only did IHP boys get their hair cut." This was the 70s after all, and girls start wearing skirts, but the students were also turning to Christ. So he's, they're talking about Homer's Iliad and Shakespeare's, all of Shakespeare's dramas, and students are turning away from this hippie um, sort of mindset, and they're not only becoming Christians and Catholics, but a lot of them ran off, uh, a number of them ran off and became Benedictine monks, and when that happened, that's when the administration came down on John Sr. and his two other professors that were doing this. They weren't saying anything about Catholicism, they were just opening their minds up to very simple things, and that naturally led to, oh, I want to be a Benedictine monk, or I want to, you know, uh, go to Mass and start a family or whatever it is. And the administration sees that, oh, they're not becoming hippies, they're becoming Catholics and pretty, pretty radical Catholics. This is a problem. And so they shut it down. But that was back, yeah, back in the 60s and 70s. That's a, that was a foundation to a lot of the liberal arts schools that you see that you see they're doing really, really well today. That's a good example of how when you expose people to um, the good, the true, and the beautiful. And it doesn't have to be explicitly Catholic, but it's grounded in natural law and objective truth. It, it, it's an inroad, you know, it, it helps people to start opening their hearts and their minds to the truths of Christ. But everybody knows, everybody knows that college campuses everywhere are overwhelmingly liberal. And what's interesting is I was raised in a home where higher education was extremely important. My father, that's how he got out of poverty. He became valedictorian of his high school. He got a scholarship. He was able to lift himself out of poverty and, you know, go on to take care of his family in Vietnam and then here in the United States. So in, for us as young children, he was always pounding at our head. You've got to get a higher education. You've got to do well. And, you know, the words Harvard and Yale and Princeton were almost sacrosanct in our minds growing up. Like, oh, if we could make it to Harvard or Yale or any of these places, wow, that would be so amazing. But now I, as a mother of four children, I've completely taken a different approach to higher education because of just how incredibly liberal all these college campuses are and how students just, they just go and they lose their faith. You know, it doesn't matter how strong their faith is in home, you know, they go and they just lose their faith. So take a look at some of these statistics, for instance, from Harvard. <coughs> Uh, it shows the bias among academics at Harvard. Look at these numbers. A combined total of 82 percent of uh, of the political leanings at, at uh, Harvard are liberal. You have 37 percent very liberal, 45 percent liberal, 16 percent moderate, and look at this: that little red sliver, 1.46 percent self-identify as conservative. I mean, no wonder students. They leave indoctrinated. Conservatives feel like they can't speak out. The fear, the real fear is I speak out and my teacher gives me a bad grade. That has happened before. I know, you know situations where that has happened. Hmm. Um, and sometimes the administration will support the students, sometimes they won't. But it's a scary thing right now and you have to really think, um, like I said, my approach to higher education for my, my children is completely different now. Um, I've, I've mentioned this before, but the best universities in the country are heavily courting my son just because he had like astronomical SAT scores and GPA and all that stuff. And, and every time I get him, I just throw him in the trash. I'm like, I'm not ha having him go there and completely lose his faith. Yeah, the, you know, you talk about the, the value of having, uh, being exposed to Homer and, and uh, Shakespeare, and then, because that's gonna open you to Christ and, and the truths, and you talk about the indoctrination, just the other side of the spectrum where they just fill you with lies and, and, and devious uh, presentation of, of truth. And I was in the middle. I went to a, a engineering school in Montana in, in the early 80s, and it was just reading, writing, arithmetic. You know, you just do the math and the science and stuff like that. So engineering was just stuff. And we didn't have any of that. There was nobody rallying here, no one advocating for that. There was no, you know, what's your sexuality or, you know, you should be uh, peace, love, dove. It was just, we went there. And a lot of people <clears throat> actually came back from the industry because they had worked as a menial laborer in the, in the like say, petroleum engineering world and wanted to come back or what their other engineering and they wanted to come back, get the degree to actually make more money doing what, you know, they're doing out there. So we had an older crowd, more um, mature crowd there uh, of people who were on campus. 
and everybody was just serious about learning. You know, so there's this, there's, there's like three layer. You know, you can just be neutral about just teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. You know, you can actually try and move the students in, in a way, like with the with the liberal arts. Like, and I hate the word liberal arts as if it's a, you know. <laughs> Most people, when you say that, they're like, oh, you're talking about you're in a liberal school. It's like no, right. kind of the opposite. But I do remember. Back in the early 80s, we had this conversation. I remember having the conversation with some of the other people that we kind of thought we were selling out because we were just going to get a job, you know, learn our how to press to digitate, you know, and, and get a job and make money and, and so forth. When others were going, it was Christendom College was open at the time, Thomas Aquinas College was open. Those guys were getting an education. We were just getting, you know, uh, taught how to do a job, basically, engineering. And we kind of thought that that was, um, we thought if there's some way in between, you know, where you could actually get a good education, but also make money when you, when you, when you came out of it would be the best thing. So there's a lot to, there's, there's starting to be schools that are, um, I think there's a vo vocational, vo votech type school that's open in Grand, Grand, um, Grand Rapids and a few places around the country now that are trying to do that, they're trying to teach you some trades while they're giving you some Thomas Aquinas and some Homer and some Shakespeare and, and actually educating you. But at the end of the day, you're going to still be able to have a good job that you can make money and, and provide for a family. So, because you don't have the luxury of just going to get this wonderful education when, you know, although I have to say some of the engineering companies were starting to hire people like that. Yeah. And they say, look, in, in six weeks, we can put you through a seminar and give you this training to do this. We need real people to think and real people out there. So it, it's going both ways. But yeah, I, I couldn't fault you on saying, hey, that's a hot yeah. bit of. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, engineering, um, engineering schools and departments, computer sciences, those tend to be the least uh, woke. But that's beginning to creep into those oh, areas absolutely. as well. Yeah. I remember I was looking at University of Michigan. We were considering that the possibility of sending our son to that because he's very good at computer sciences and engineering. And I was just looking at their page, computer sciences engineering department, and I was looking at the speakers and events. And they had a speaker about, you know, gender studies and mathematics and computer. And I'm like, what, what on earth does this have to do with computer science? What does this have to do with any of that? Um, and then they have a required diversity course that every single yeah, freshman has to take. They've recently introduced that. Um, also college campuses now um, for freshmen and coming, not just University of Michigan, everywhere. You've got in every class when the teachers are introducing themselves now, they have to talk about what their preferred pronouns are, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. You've got to think, too, that, like, a student at University of Michigan, most of those, and I, I know some, some, some guys over there, they, they probably see the, you know, the diversity stuff that they have to fill out and all that, and obviously they don't agree with it, but you just, if I answer this wrong, I'm going to get kicked out or whatever it is. I'm not going to be able to move forward. And um, it's that slow conditioning, and that's why I think people that – maybe they go to those schools and they don't put their foot down when they ought to, they end up graduating and they're silent about very basic things. They're silent about abortion. They're silent about, you know, boys calling themselves girls or this or that. It's like this slow conditioning where, and it starts with a little thing like that. Hey, here's, you got to fill this, fill this little thing out. And that conditions you. So whenever you leave, whenever you leave college, you, you're, you know, you're, you're a coward. You're indifferent about everything, especially things that are just black and white. I guess the advice I'd have right now for someone, you go to the community colleges, get your credits. Uh, a lot of those credits you can get at a community college. You can be staying at home, save a lot of money, get your credits at a community college, and then, you know, maybe spend, because you're going to be older then, right? You're going to be a couple, three years older and you're more grounded, uh, more able to stand up on your own and, and realize that what's going on around you. And then your last couple years or whatever, you focus on whatever area you're in rather than being 18 and naive and on campus and hearing all this stuff and getting with the wrong crowd and everything like that. But we have to also uh, realize it's not just in, in, in colleges. I mean, all the institutions, there's been a slow march through the institutions. Uh, every institution, uh, and, and I think it was uh, so Michael Voris was talking about, I think it was Stanford, uh, Stanford that the judges had to go to get their law degree. And that was one of, the, one of those that was tipped early on, back in, you know, starting in the 20s and 30s, the, the liberal bent going in there. <laughs> And the judges coming out of there were starting to get formed in a different mindset. So there was a concerted effort uh, in a lot of areas to tilt things. And it, and it is very insidious and nefarious uh, that March. And we don't, we wouldn't think that way. We wouldn't try. But people who are trying to accomplish something, who really have an agenda, um, do understand what happens when you start changing the, the wellsprings of education 
and uh, even the art and the sports and uh, media, uh, politics, all those areas, and they look at the, the where are people being formed, and that's what they go out. And the, the, the guy behind it all, of course, is Satan. I mean, he's going to be the one trying to pull the strings. And, you know, I think there's only one conspiracy. It's Genesis 315, uh, the woman and, 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 and the serpent. And that's always the Blessed Mother and, and the angel say trying to get us to, to be inspired to do good. And this other, you know, the devil and all of his minions are trying to get everybody inspired to do bad. And this day and age, it seems like they're kind of, the scale's tilting a little bit. Yeah. I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the church... Um, encourages people in the way that their seminary systems are set up is that you go through years of study with philosophy and that doesn't just mean philo logic rhetoric philosophy metaphysics and then you get into the theology and this is what's unfortunate one of many things that's unfortunate about the protestants they don't they don't do that they just grab their bible and they just go right through it and it's all you know theology with them but that emphasis put on these very basic realities is so important because that's the foundation that's the bedrock of everything that we know in in scripture so we don't just yeah it's divinely revealed that's a gift given to us and we can't know it on our own but that doesn't mean that philosophy gets thrown out the window whenever we do have the bible in front of us or whenever we, we are trying to interpret um something that the church you know definitively teaches um and so many people skip that step i remember brad you got me thinking about college when I was there and it, <laughs> I didn't pay too much attention my first three years but um, I was being indoctrinated in a good way with philosophy and religion and uh, rhetoric and all, all of those classes and I didn't like them very much but I kind of gutted through them and um, it was a leadership class um, that was uh, put together by our team chaplain, our football team chaplain. His name is Dr. Peter Jennings. And it was just basic stuff. It was just, we were going through basic leadership principles and he was so hardcore, Dr. Jennings was. Like you, it was one of those classes where you didn't show up unprepared because if you did, he'd call you out and you'd be embarrassed by everybody. But we weren't talking about these crazy biblical principles and this and that it was very basic stuff and that's what sparked my own my own conversion uh when i when i was there and um that's what hillsdale does that's what good schools do they just present very basic things to you and they don't really shove anything down your throat but they present present very basic truths to you and i think that it it opens you up to um you know the treasures of the catholic faith and that's what i think that's the whole point of those of those things john senior his thing was he talks a lot about wonder, um, that first step to everything that you know in life. It starts with wonder, looking around the natural world and having a wonder about uh, really God's creation. Um, and that's what opens the door. That's what leads to everything else. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I went to college 30 years ago. I was an undergrad and they, they had the indoctrination back then. I remember I majored in philosophy and I took a Greek philosophy course expecting to learn about Plato and Aristotle and all the Greek philosophers. And instead, we spent most of our time reading feminism interpretations of Plato oh. and Aristotle. Now, I was not a Catholic at the time, but still, I was a conservative Protestant, and I remember getting into it with my professor, who was a hippie with, you know, white hair and long, yeah. you know, ponytail. Um, but it was frustrating back then, and I would just address parents out there now who may be thinking about, you know, might have children who are school age who are thinking about what am I going to do for college. Um, I would say resist the temptation if your student, if, if your children are being courted by some of the best universities, resist the temptation to immediately just send them there thinking, because believe me, I understand the temptation because going to some of the best universities in the world, getting these degrees can really open a lot of doors. It can help set your career. It can, you know, it can do, do all of that, but take the long view and remember, you know, what does it matter if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? So they might go there, they might get a great degree, they might have a great career, vocation, whatever, but if they lose their soul in the process, then what's the point of any of this? And the fact is, even if you go to a smaller, less recognized school and you do well there, God can still provide a great you know, career for you, a great life for you. It's not the end of the world or anything, not, not by any means. So I would just encourage parents, resist this temptation to immediately jump at the opportunity to go to the very best school possible. Right now, my daughter is in her first year of college. She's going local, she stays at home, and it's wonderful because every, 
every time, no, night when she comes home, she's able simply to talk with me about, oh, my professor said this, and this student is talking about transphobia, and you know, this, I'm studying this in this class, and so we're able to talk about things, she's able to vent, um, and then I'm like a sounding board for her, and that is invaluable, parents, it is so invaluable to be able to do that with your children and shore up their faith that way. Yeah, that's huge, that's another huge, huge thing about having the ability to stay at home when you go to a local community college, not only do you save money at the community college, but you also save money and stay at home, but you have that ability to talk to somebody who's really interested in your life and about all the struggles you have there. And, I, and for my own, I mean, we're homeschooling right now, and one of the big things I'm going to be working on in the future, besides you know religion class and that, we're already doing religion and math and everything, but working on that philosophy, getting your ability to think. What do you mean when you say this? Well, how does the logic flow of that? And it doesn't have to be all dry and drab and everything, but introducing you know the perennial, it, the church requires it to be a seminarian. You're, you're required to have um, something like 30, 24 credits, I think, in, in Thomistic philosophy, the perennial philosophy. It's mentioned twice in canon law. And for, for that, for, it, for speaking, for thinking, for you know, clearly putting your thoughts down, you have to be able to put all that together. And, and I think even far more than Homer and, and Shakespeare is uh, you know, uh, Plato and Aristotle, especially Aristotle, uh, what they had to do. And, and, and it's not, it didn't just start stop with Aristotle from the third century BC. People have built on what he has and fine-tuned it. You know, St. Thomas and others have all, you know, the scholastic method and all that. So it's really gone through a lot of um, iterations and, and tweaking, but it's still the same uh, essential uh, Thomistic uh, Aristotelian philosophy. And I would really uh, encourage people to um, expose your kids to that somewhere along the line as well. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add is um, uh, if, you, if, you are, if you are in college, like you just said, you're having your kid. He's he's focused on some. He's focused on philosophy or whatever you're teaching him. And he's not being distracted by this or that. College kids, as we mentioned in the beginning, it's very easy to be distracted by things that, in my opinion, don't really matter a whole lot. You don't have to have a great political take when you're you know 20 years old in college. Um, I love the. The picture on the you know, National Geographic channel and it zooms in on the lion's face that's looking at his prey. He's got all these gnats around him, and he doesn't budge because he's so fixated, he's so focused on it. Um, and the, I think the analogy there is that for these guys that are in college, focus on things like natural law, divine revelation. Don't think that you need to have every single political take figured out. That's the stuff that's important right there, right now. And you're learning those things so that you can go out in the world and be that, you know, another Christ in the world. Um, that's what would be important for, for, any college, for any college student right now. Well, thank you for joining us for today's episode of The Download. Now, please join us as we finish in prayer, begging Our Lady's intercession for our nation and our church. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Salve Regina, Mante Misericordia, Vita Lucero, et Spes Nostra Salve. Ate clamamos exudes fidebe, ate suspiramos gementes et lentes in hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ergo advocata nostra, illos duos misericordes oculos, ad nos converte, benediesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O clemens, o pia, o dulcis Virgo Maria. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for the download. We premiere a new episode like this every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. From all of us here at Church Militant, God bless you.